The Holy Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do, so now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I no longer am in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Have you ever thought I have talked and talked and talked and all I can do now is pray? I distinctly remember dropping an 18-year-old girl off at Burge Hall as an incoming University of Iowa freshman and thinking exactly that and then pretty much praying all the way home. In our gospel reading, Jesus has been talking and talking and talking to his loved ones the night before his very soon now death on the cross and then his soon after that return trip home to his Father in heaven. And in John 17, in the very last part of this extended discourse that he had, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, he reaches the point where apparently the only thing he can do anymore is pray, and so he does. He prays for himself as he readies himself for the cross, and then his return trip home, and then he prays for his disciples, prays for his loved ones, his church, after he's gone. John 17, 1, after Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. If you heard me read that earlier, Jesus speaks a lot about glory and being glorified and glorifying God. You need to realize in these verses that when that word glory is in Jesus' mouth, especially in the Gospel of John, he's talking about something way different than we by and large talk about when we talk about glory because we, probably all of us, I'm pretty sure, think that glory has to do with being lifted up by the praise and applaud of others. Jesus, on the other hand, when he talks about being glorified and giving glory to God, is first of all talking about doing what God gave him to do, even when doing that will ultimately and soon now lead him to be lifted up on a cross. I glorified you, said Jesus in verse 4, by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And that word finishing is absolutely, and John, who loves these kind of things, is absolutely a pre-echo of what Jesus will say with his very last breath on earth hanging from the cross. He will say, it is finished. We tend to think that glory refers to all things being, well, glorious. Jesus, on the other hand, sees glory in making known and in being God's saving love for the world, even when there's the most unglorious of prices to pay for doing that. Father, Jesus prayed, glorify me all the way to the cross and then all the way home. And with that prayer prayed and the glory of the cross now just hours away, Jesus turns his prayers toward his loved ones, his followers whom he will be leaving behind with God-glorifying work of their own to do when he leaves. 
Holy Father, he says, protect them in your name that you have given me. Protect them in your name. Hallowed be your name. Jesus told them and us regularly to pray. And what does this mean for us? Well, says Luther in the Catechism, God's name is hallowed whenever the word of God is taught in its truth and purity. And we as children of God live holy lives according to it. Protect them in your name that you have given me. Jesus now prays on behalf of his loved ones and is doing so. He's praying for the teachings they will teach and the sermons they will preach and the things they will do that in all things the word of God will be known and the will of God will be done through them even if it means as it will that they each of us in their own way will have their own crosses to take up along the way. Then he continues his prayer and he does it as it turns out in a way that tells us Jesus doesn't just want his loved ones protected just for the sake of being protected. He wants his loved ones protected for the purpose of a result. He wants them protected, he says, so that they hold that thought. We'll get back to it. Ever since seminary, one of my very favorite writers and theologians has been Frederick Buechner. His writings over the years have blessed me and influenced me, blessed and influenced my preaching and teaching, shown up in ways I should have probably footnoted, but I didn't even know I was footnoting him, more ways than I can name. Pam recently, when I was working my way back from this workshop I was at in San Antonio, uh, texted me or uh, emailed me a, a, a quote from a Frederick Beatner quote of the day website that is out there now, and I read it. It was just absolutely classic Beatner. It was exquisite. It was titled, The Gods, lowercase g, are dying. He wrote of all the things that people have treated like gods, lowercase g, by expecting those things to give their lives ultimate purpose and meaning and hope, only to discover that those gods, lowercase g, can't deliver on their promises to give you those ultimate things in life. You put your ultimate trust in them and they will let you down every single time. Thus the title, the gods, lowercase g, are dying. It was a wonderful read. My soul rejoiced in these exquisitely stated thoughts from my old mentor. And then I looked at comments, starting with someone named Joan, who wrote, I have read Frederick Buechner many times and shared him, but no more. My God, the God who created everything and gave his only begotten son to die on a cross for our sins is the only God there is. There are no other gods. Oh, she put an apostrophe in that. <laughs> no wonder with writing like this their people are turning from the truth. I thought to myself, actually I found myself sitting where I was actually sputtering out loud to myself, you, 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 you've totally missed the point. And then things started getting ugly in my brain. I went to dark places. I said, how dense are you, Joan? I'll bet, I'll bet, first of all, that apostrophe was in the wrong place. And I'll bet, I'll bet that you pronounce his name Buchner. I told her. And then came this guy named Donovan who posted, yo, Frederick, you are an utter dumb beep. If you think there's more than one God, you stupid idiot. I thought, What? <laughs> Donovan, you're talking about Frederick for crying out loud, Beekner. You're clearly the one who's an utter dumb, Eep, stupid idiot, you stupid idiot. Okay, back to Jesus' prayer. Before he left the world to leave his plans and purposes in the world in the hands of his followers, his church, by the way, he makes clear later, isn't just them, it's this group right here too. He prays, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, but do so with a result. Protect them in your name so that they may be one, as you and I are one. 
and make them one as you and I are one, he will later in the chapter go on to say, not just so they can sit around singing kumbaya, all warm and fuzzy in their love for you and their love for each other. Make my followers one, Jesus said, so that in seeing my followers, my church, and their love for each other, the world, Heavenly Father, all people may see and know you and your truth, which is above all the truth of your love, your love for the church and the world and for all people. Why does Jesus pray that his church would be protected and that protected it would be united for the sake of its mission, its mission of hope, and reconciliation in this sin not united but divided world. Okay, that loving unity, that loving oneness in Christ church, how's that gone, would you say? How's that going these days, would you say? Does the world look at the church and our Facebook rants and our tweets and and our actions and say, look at how united they are in their love for each other and in the way they make God's known love for all people. Pretty much probably not, right? Holy Father Jesus prayed, and I imagine, I'm actually quite sure he's praying still because he's waiting for this to be finally answered. Even Jesus apparently has prayers like that. Holy Father Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as you and I are one. This, by the way, is a sermon that I finished. I didn't even finish. It was 7.58 this morning and we have 8 o'clock service. I said, Pam, you know this. This is what I got. It isn't done because this this topic has been a wrestling match all week. So I'm going to just give you some thoughts and send you home with your own thoughts. But I think it's a topic for the church. May they be one. First, the unity of the Christian church and unity within Christian congregations matters. It always has, but I just believe it matters these days as much or more than it ever has because in a world these days in so many ways so deeply divided, a church divided is just more of the same old, same old. A church united is hope for the world. A second theme, and this is so hard for people, I think, including me, but whatever it entirely means, unity in the church does not mean sameness in everything or agreeing about everything. As Christians, unity is found in the common ground of our united confession, Jesus is Lord, a confession which is then often expressed or meant to be not just in our words saying such, but in our loves shown to each other, especially and precisely when we aren't the same in everything and even when we disagree and even when we passionately disagree on things. I need, and I'd like to suggest that we all need, brothers and sisters in Christ who don't think entirely like me, in some cases even passionately, because if disagreeing passionately, we can nevertheless worship side by side in the sanctuary of the common ground of our common confession, Jesus is Lord. I think not only will that do us good, I think it will do the world good because the world seems to have lost its ability to find common ground, except by going out and hanging out on these fringes where I discover common ground with the people who are on this fringe with me and they hate all the same people I do. The world needs Christ's church disagreeing as profusely and passionately on some things as we need to, but doing so on the common ground of the God made known in Jesus Christ who is a God of love and that love is for all people. A third thing. Speaking of God's love for all people, as I've gotten older, I've gotten, I was going to say more liberal, but then I decided if I say liberal, then somebody's going to toss me into a particular political camp where they now know everything I think about everything, and I don't even know everything I think about everything, so it's not fair. So I decided, not that I've gotten more liberal, I'm going to say that I've lightened up some about a few things. I, I mean, you know what, whether it's who you love 
or exactly what you believe or where you're from. I mean, you know what? Be who God made you to be. Be good to yourself. Be good to others. Truly, God bless you. I guess what I'm saying is that with age and hopefully with wisdom, although Donovan on Facebook would no doubt think it's because I'm a dumb, beep, stupid idiot, I think I've come to accept people and accept more things about people and frankly even rejoice in more things about people than I probably used to. And I want to be the church, and I, I think I am the pastor of a church where that's true about us as a church as well. And I think God likes that about me and about us. I believe that. Which leads to a fourth thing. The more I've found myself at a place where I accept people and accept more things about people, the more I really find myself struggling to accept people who don't accept people. This is called irony, right? I love everybody, except I have a terrible time loving people who don't love everybody. I can't stand them. (laughs) Now, I say that by way of telling you that when it comes to this whole unity thing, um, I pray that Jesus is still at the right hand praying on my behalf because, you know what, I have some work to do. And I need kind of him in that camp with me. A fifth thing. Let's remember that this prayer Jesus prayed for the unity of the church and the world was prayed the night before he died on the cross. Which is a reminder that finally, in this world anywhere, our prayer will never fully be defined or answered by our unity. Our unity. Our unity will finally be found in Jesus and in his grace and in his death on the cross for the forgiveness of sinners, including the sinner who's named me, including the sinner who's named you, and including the sinner and sinners who are named Donovan on Facebook. And a final thing, that they may be one, Let's remember, too, that these words in this text are not a commandment that Jesus commands to his church. These words are a prayer that Jesus prayed. And seated at the right hand of the Father is praying still for his church. And you know, when he prayed that prayer the first time, his disciples were gathered around him, listening in, joining in. I believe he still invites his church to to listen in, to join in that same prayer. Let us do so remembering that prayers are not prayed only with the words we speak to God. Prayers are also prayed, even sometimes one just little tiny step at a time, in words and actions toward one another and toward others. My sisters and brothers, liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats, saints and sinners, sinners and saints, wrapped in his grace, forgiven by his mercy, led by his spirit, prayed for by his prayers, let us continue to grow in being Christ's church, witnessing to God's love for the world with words to be sure, but also in the way we treat each other and the way we love each other. Even when you and I once in a while, I mean, this could happen, when you and I once in a while look at each other, we both find ourselves thinking, You think what? Holy Father, protect us in your name that we may be one even as you and your Son, our Lord and Savior, are one. Amen.